Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining with us this evening. Um, we're just going to keep our seats and sing a couple of choruses before we start our evening worship. So the first one is Hosanna. chorus his majesty worship his majesty Our scripture reading tonight is Psalm 92, and it's just the first uh, few verses, and it says, A psalm, a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to his name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp and to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. That though the wicked sprout like grass and the evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. And I was thinking about this whenever I was driving up in the car and you know whenever this psalm was written I bet they didn't think that years to come we would be sitting in straight congregational reading it on a Sunday evening that we are here to give thanks to God for what he's done for us you know we we have the the wonderful chance to look back at the cross and whoever wrote that psalm whether it be David or somebody else they looked forward to the day that the cross. They looked forward to that day where they would be redeemed. But we, we can look back to what actually Jesus has done. And we can be so thankful for the works of his hands on the cross. For the piercings that he took our punishment. And it is, it's just humbling to come into his presence. To come and to, to sing of his steadfast love for us and his faithfulness each and every day. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before a holy God this evening, that we can read your word. Lord, that we can read your word freely and hear it proclaimed. Lord, that we live in a country that is free of persecution. Lord, that we can open our Bibles at any t- point, Lord, and we can just read of your, of your redeeming love for each and every one of us without fear of somebody knocking on our door, without fear of being thrown into prison or even murdered. And Lord, we thank you that you are so faithful and you're so gracious to each and every one of us. Lord, we are sinful, we are wicked. And Lord, sometimes we don't understand just the tremendous love you have for us because we see ourselves and we we do see what we truly are. But yet we all, through Christ, Lord, you see us in a totally different light. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he did on the cross, for what he accomplished by dying for us, that we would be right before you, that we can have a relationship with the holy God. Lord, we just thank you for for our church fellowship. Lord, we thank you for how you've brought us together. Lord, we thank you for how you have sustained us through the years. And Lord, we thank you for the times of fellowship we have. And Lord, Lord, we're so thankful, even just for this morning, for the new Sunday fellowship group. Lord, we thank you for the blessing it was to be around one another. Lord, and just sharing with one another in friendship, but sharing as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, you have drawn us together. And we are thankful and mindful of just how you hold us together. And Lord, we just pray for those that can't be with us in church this evening and that will be watching on the DVDs or listening um, through the week. Lord, we... um, want you to draw close to them, Lord, let them know that we, um, we think of them and we pray for them and we trust that they will feel your presence with them as they watch and listen um, on and know that they are as much part of our service as, as those that are in the building. And Lord, we thank you for the AV team and the musicians and for all that they do behind the scenes and, and making sure that we can keep in contact and that we can share with one another in such a practical way. But Lord, we just are so thankful for them. Lord, we thank you for how you have brought each and every one to save in faith in you. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. And we just pray that you would continue um, this evening. And we just pray for our brother Calvin as he comes to speak, Lord, that you would just equip him with words that we need to hear, words that we need to know more about you, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself um, more and more to each and every one of us. Because, Lord, we we need you in our lives. We need to see you. We need to um, listen to you, Lord, so that we can be the witnesses you want us to be. So that we can be the disciples that you've called us to be. And, Lord, we just ask that you would equip us and enable us to, to, to do your work. That you would give us the strength and the energy that we would have your presence and that you, you would be our comfort whenever times are tough. And Lord, that as in this village, Lord, as we try to be a light in the darkness, that you would go before us and that you would just open hearts and minds to you, Lord, because it's your people. It, these are your people, Lord, not ours. And Lord, it's you, that do the, it's you who calls. And Lord, we just... Thank you for the calling in each and every one of our lives. And we think of our missionaries. And we think of Johnny and Catherine, particularly out in Mozambique. Lord, as well as the others that are closer and over in England. And Lord, they're doing the work that you've called them to. And we're so mindful that it's hard. And they need our prayer and they need our support. And we just ask that you would draw close to them this evening as well. Lord, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for um, this morning, the service today, and for Junior Church, and for all the activities, Sunday school, and for 
everything that happens within this church. Lord, we just pray that you would just use those times to speak into lives, that they would trust in you at young ages, and that you would just bless them, bless our children, Lord, and, and help us to lead them in your knowledge. Lord, we just ask that you would just go before us this evening, and that everything that would be done would be glorifying to you, and that we would know that it was, it was good to meet with the Lord. And we just ask that in Jesus' name this evening. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand and sing our opening praise then. And it's lift high the name of Jesus. just quickly run through the announcements then. Um, so again, Calvin, you're very welcome with us uh, this evening and um, we look forward to what you're going to speak to us about. And then there's tea and fellowship following the evening service tonight, so you don't need to rush off. Um, stay and enjoy a cup of tea and some refreshments. So, And then looking ahead, um, there's no mums and tots this week um, due to half term. Then Wednesday is our normal Bible study and prayer time. Uh, and then Thursday morning is our morning prayer time at 10 a.m. And Time Out Ladies Bible Study will be on on Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Then Junior and Cedar Pathfinders on Friday night at 7 as usual. And Strayed Youth at 8.15. Then next Sunday morning, our Sunday school is at 10.15. Uh, the morning worship and the evening worship will be taken by Reuben Lyons, who's the Assistant Minister in Newton Arge Congregational. Then just another reminder, uh, the upcoming members meeting in March, um, the diagonal vacancies. Um, so John Hire is up for renomination, and then there's one other vacancy declared. So um, those need to be in, I think, by next weekend. So um, just if you are thinking of nominating anybody, please make sure that you get um, their permission to have their name put forward before um, you submit the nomination. Then there's a choir practice, so those of you with the vocal talents that I don't have, <laughs> please remember that. So um, next Tuesday, the 21st, 8 p.m., there's a choir practice, so anybody involved in the choir, please plan that into your diaries. And then Sunday Fellowship, 
Um, so it was the first Sunday this morning, and it was great. Um, so you have another, another opportunity to attend. Um, if you missed it this morning, um, it will be on Sunday the 26th and every other week from that. It was brilliant time fellowship together, so do you plan to attend? Um, I think that's all the announcements. Um, so we'll stand and sing our next uh, hymn, which is, I am so glad that our Father in heaven, and then after that I'll hand over to Calvin gladly. words of welcome. It's a real privilege to have been with you today and to share in your services here in Strait. I bring you greetings, of course, from Knockbracken Congregational Church, my own church there uh, in southeast Belfast. Uh, and we do give thanks for the Irish Baptist College uh, sending us two students uh, to take our services today. Um, we're thankful for that. Apologies too from my wife who can't be with us this evening. She was here this morning. Uh, she's speaking at an event in Port Stewart Baptist. Uh, and so her and my daughter have headed up there uh, to speak at that meeting. So yeah, thanks anyway for the invite. Uh, it's great to be here. If you have your Bible with you, please do turn. Brian had us in the Psalms already. Uh, I want to take us back to the Psalms. Uh, we want to go to Psalm 11. Psalm 11 this evening, and we'll take time to read all of the Psalms, just seven verses. Uh, and then we'll have a, have a look at this Psalm together. Psalm 11, I'm beginning to read at verse 1, and this is the Word of God. To the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked 
Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Yeah, we'll take time to pray, uh, to ask God's blessing on the reading of his infallible word this evening. Let's take time to pray. Father God, again, uh, we come to your word. Uh, Father, we come uh, not to hear the wisdom or the anecdotes of man, but instead, Father, we come to hear your voice. Uh, Father, we confess that we need you every day and, and every hour of every day. So, Lord, would you come and speak to us now? Would you come and encourage us and lift us up, remind us of your steadfast love toward us? We pray that you would give us powers of attention, drive out all distracting thoughts of tomorrow or whatever these next weeks uh, bring forth for us. Give us concentration on your word and speak, Lord, for your servants here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 11, uh, like so many other Psalms, I suppose, arises out of a crisis. And in 1 Samuel 27, David uh, finds himself again hunted, and the odds seem stacked against him. He's really in trouble. Uh, so often is the, is the way with David, if you've read through Samuel uh, or uh, heard messages on it, then you'll understand that he goes through these cycles of being in trouble, uh, being chased and hunted, and he's always, almost always, on the run. And here he finds himself again so beset with trials and dangers and, and threats to his life. And the worst thing of all is that it's not just from the enemies that are outside, but instead it's his own people. Uh, it's the people that are closest to him. It's the people that ought to have his back, as it were, that are causing him uh, grief and anxiety and stress. And he has uh, felt under so much stress that he has decided, in his own mind at least, that it might be a good idea to flee right into the enemy's camp, right into the land of Gath uh, and the land of the Philistines. I wonder then tonight, is there someone within the hearing of this message and you haven't had things easy uh, life has not been particularly kind, and it just seems so difficult. Uh, perhaps it would be easier if the trouble was only from those you identify as unfriendly. But instead, some of the stress and some of the anxiety is being caused and created by those who should be your defenders, people who should have your back, uh, they're actually adding to your anxiety. And sometimes that's really difficult. Sometimes that's really hard to speak out. And that's really hard to vocalize. And, and it's hard to know where to turn when you're in trouble like that. Well, uh, what I want to say then is that this psalm is in the Bible because God wants to encourage you with the truth that is contained in it. There are no superfluous psalms. In fact, there's no superfluous chapters in the Bible. They're, they're in there for a reason. They're in there for your good uh, and for your encouragement sometimes and for your challenge other times, of course. Uh, but they're in there for a purpose. Uh, well, some of David's own people uh, are questioning his wisdom this notion of escaping from the people that are hunting him uh, to take him into, and, and his men with him, into Gath seems like a daft thing. And so they urge him instead to flee to the hills uh, like he has done successfully in the past. Well, verse 1 says, How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? 
David thinks this strategy that they're suggesting, even though it has served him well in the past, is not such a good idea now. He says, effectively, I'll be vulnerable up there. I'll be as vulnerable as a bird perched up on a tree, highlighted against the brightness of the sky behind. Uh, if, if we were saying it, we might say something like we'd be a sitting duck. You know that expression? A sitting duck just, just sitting there waiting to be shot, uh, waiting to be picked off. I'll be as vulnerable as a bird up there, says David. Well, one good reason for thinking that this psalm is about this, this incident in 1 Samuel 27 is because in chapter 26, verse 20, just a few verses before the incident, before he decides on this uh, ploy of going to Gath, he describes himself there as a partridge in the mountains. Partridge in the mountains, and so we put these uh, two pieces of evidence together. A partridge in the mountains, uh, flee like a bird, uh, and so we think, well, there's a possibility at least, isn't that? It seems a likelihood uh, that this psalm is written about this experience. David says, listen, the enemy is waiting for me already. Look at verse 2, for behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. And so David says, this is how serious the situation is. He says, effectively, listen, all bets are off. The rules of engagement have shifted. It, it isn't the way it used to be. Uh, it's not like the enemy is right in front of me and I know uh, where the attack is coming from. And so in spite of Saul's great promises to me that everything will be well and you'll be looked after, uh, he is not to be trusted, thinks David. And so even now his, his men have arrows attached to bows. That's how, that's how serious he's taking this threat. That's how imminent he thinks attack will be upon his person. They're already dug in. They're waiting on my next predictable move. And if it counts for nothing that I am an upright man, they're going to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart, said the verse. Then the very fabric of society has failed. All rules have changed. The ground has shifted under my feet. It feels like that sometimes, doesn't it, in life? that the rules have all changed, and things that you were sure of in the past, now uh, you just can't be sure of them. And now the things that used to cause you joy and comfort, uh, and you knew you were firm and solid on a good foundation, suddenly uh, you find yourself on ground that just doesn't seem so sure any longer. You begin to get anxious. You begin to think attack is imminent, and you don't know who to trust. Verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's as if David's saying, listen, I don't know who to trust anymore. I, I don't know what the rules are. It's, it's all changed. And so that's his first reason for rejecting the advice to flee to the hills. He cannot trust Saul. He cannot trust things to have been the way they have in the past. Things have changed. The ground is shifting, and he's not certain anymore of Saul. And his second reason is this. He can trust the Lord. And that's how he begins the psalm. In the Lord, he says, in Yahweh, I take refuge. It might seem like the daftest thing in the world to go and hide in the camp of his country's most hostile neighbor. The Philistines have caused him grief over and over again. Uh, but he has confidence in the Lord. He has confidence and he has strength in the Lord of hosts. And that's the only way we can proceed sometimes, isn't it? And I think that's how God brings us to a point in our life where we begin to think, I'm not sure who to trust anymore. I'm not sure where my life is going or what the future holds. But I know this, that God has not changed. I can trust in the Lord of hosts. 
God has kept him safe so far, says David, in his own mind, and he will continue to do so even inside the land of my enemies. Even though it seems ridiculous and it seems too great a risk to take, I'm prepared to do it because I trust in my God. And then at verses 4 to 7, David turns his attention away from the plight that he is in to the God that he worships. And again, just right off the bat, that's, that's just such a strategy. What a strategy to get your mind off the difficulties and the, the uncertainty about the future and to look at those things that are certain. Look at the things and the God in whom we can trust. It's as if he's saying, listen, down here there is chaos. The anointed king, me, is on the run and he's in hiding. And the rejected king, Saul, is the one who's out pursuing the anointed king. The world has gone mad. It's upside down. This is not how things are supposed to be. But the Lord is in residence, and he's seated on his throne. Verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And his throne, says David, is built on foundations that are righteousness. In other words, it's unshakable. It's not going to move. I can have confidence because God is on his throne. That's an encouraging thing to know that God does not change and is not moved when we are and is not chaotic and life is not crazy and upside down. God is in control. Habakkuk, when he saw the wickedness and the twisted evil all around him in the world, found comfort in the same fact. He says there in verse 20 of chapter 2, but the Lord, Yahweh, capital uh, letters there, is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. All of a sudden, there is much comfort this evening for a people surrounded by a culture determined to marginalize Christians in seeing and in believing that God is on his throne and that he's not going anywhere. He's not going to change his pronouns for anyone. Uh, he's not going to move with the winds of culture and society. He is steadfast and he is firm, and his statutes are unchanging. He won't be voted out. He can't be unseated or undermined. Uh, he is not moved. Of course, this picture of God on his throne is, is not at all to suppose or suggest that God is passive or inert. God is anything, but look at verse 4 again. It continues, his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. In other words, David says, listen, he, he might be in a seated position, but that's not to suppose that he's idle. It's not to suppose that, that he's somehow flummoxed by what is going on on earth. That's a good thing for you to know tonight. If your world is upside down and chaotic, if somehow you feel like you're losing control, be assured of this. God has not lost control. He is sovereign and he will remain sovereign even over the things that are happening in your life. His position is one of strength. His position is not one of weakness. His position is not one of inactivity. He sees, says the word of God. It's a look of intense concentration. He is watching the children of men. He has his eyes upon us, and he sees us all, both the righteous and the wicked. Listen, believer, he sees you tonight just where you are. He, he sees and knows the pain that you're in. He knows the torment of soul at, at how things are in your life, in your family, in your heart, or in your mind, turning things over, wondering what's going to happen next, perhaps even unhappy, frustrated about how things have turned out. He sees it. He knows where you are in all of this. 
and he sees the injustice too. He sees how people treat you. He sees how the world treats the church. He sees it all, and he's not unfeeling about it. He sees how the, whip, the wicked seem to prosper. They seem to be Teflon to all of the woes that, that so beset us. And they flourish, don't they? And they seem to be doing great and unconcerned about God. He sees that. He sees it all. But it will not be forever. It will not stay like that. He will not turn a blind eye forever. Here's verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. There's texts like that in the Bible all over the scriptures, and yet we're, we're so shy to, to read them out in public. And yet here's the truth. He hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Those who are doing harm to, to those girls that Lisa was talking about this morning, God hates that. He hates that behavior. He hates that attitude. And he's not unmindful of it. It hasn't escaped his notice. He sees it. The psalmist skims over the righteous here with, with a scant mention. He returned to them in verse 7, but, but look at what he says about the wicked. His, his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And the writer anthropomorphizes here. Of course, God has no parts. He, he is a divinely simple being without parts. He doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have eyelids. And, and yet that's the language that the psalmist used because that's the, the language that we understand. It's good for us. Our psalmist just wants to say something like, listen, God in his internal reality, in his being, as a part of his fabric, in his very nature, he hates wickedness and evil. He would simply not be holy if he did not abhor evil at the very core of his being. That's who he is with his soul, with, with all of who he is as God. He hates sin. And he is not passive about his feelings. He is not uh, in his stable attitude towards sin. He is not passive towards sin. He will act. David borrows from the description of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 and the scorching wind from Pharaoh's dream in Genesis 41, fire and brimstone, now called sulfur, is used to describe God's ultimate action against evil. And this has moved, I think, slightly beyond uh, simply what his reaction to Saul's wickedness is, to the stress and anxiety that is being caused and poured out on David. I think he's moved. I think he's gone cosmic. I think he's looking away to the future, a future of when the writer is writing this psalm, and I think future even of today. He's looking to the ultimate end of time. He's looking to the final response of God in the final day, the day of his judgment. In that day, Saul and his men will be included in that group that will be dealt with in the last and final judgment. Look at verse 6. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Listen, all of this is non-negotiable. All of this will come to pass. God will not be talked out of it. He will not change his mind. He does not change uh, his plans. Just because society changes its values, we might say loses them entirely, does not mean that God must change course to, listen, he will not and the church should do likewise. We shouldn't change our attitude either. And of course, for that reason, those of us who have been declared righteous have this very hope and this certainty in life that it will lead to and result in us seeing God face to face. And on that day, those of us who are in Christ, we talked about that this morning, 
But those of us who are in Christ will have nothing to fear from God's eyes seeing us through and through. We want to see his face rather than fearing to see his face as the wicked should do. Those wicked and those who love violence should, should fear the day when they see the Lord face to face. That will not be a good day for them. Listen, whatever you are facing tonight, you have grounds to trust if you are a believer in him. We have a place to go to that is away from fear and opposition and insecurity. And the simple message from God's word this evening from Psalm 11, and I'm going to leave you with this, simple message is this. That place to go to is the Lord himself. He is our strong place. He is our tower of refuge. Here's what verse 7 says. For the Lord, that is Yahweh, is righteous. He loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, be comforted tonight by the word of God. Amen and amen. Well, we're going to respond to the word of God. Uh, we're going to sing our final piece. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end. Let's stand and sing in response to the word of God, and then I'll pray and then there's a cup of tea, I think. Great. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we uh, humbly bow before you. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement and the strength that we can gain from it. Father, we thank you for the ultimate truth, for the objective truth, for a truth that can be relied on. Father, we thank you that you see us and you see us just where we are. You are not unmindful of the anxiety and the stress and the life uh, and the position that we're in right now. 
Uh, Father, we pray that, uh, that we would be comforted by your word. Oh, Lord, that we would put our trust not in men or in chariots or in horses or in technology or in society or in uh, established churches or any other, any other thing. Oh, Father, that our trust would be in our God who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth in whom we can have trust. Father, we pray that this uh, word would be applied by your Holy Spirit to our hearts. Uh, Father, that you would uh, bless us with it and may it cause fruit uh, to develop in our lives. Father, we thank you for the time of fellowship that's, that's coming just now. Uh, we thank you for whatever has been prepared, uh, for those who have prepared it. Bless it to us, Father. Bless, with, uh, bless those who, who must leave us uh, and head home. We pray that you'd give them uh, traveling mercies too. And Father, we ask all of these things in and through the lovely name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you.